Hey, hey, what's up, guys? It's Jordan with the Laundromat Resource Podcast. This is show 111, 111. And I am pumped you're here today because today we're going to hang out with Ryan Shoemaker uh, in the great white north of Canada. And we go through a ton of cool stuff. He is brand new into the business, just a few months in. And we go through and break down the whole process of how he got into this deal, how he got seller financing, how he's running his laundromat, how it's performing now, what his plans are. I mean, this is an awesome episode and you're just going to love Ryan. He's just a great, great dude. So super pumped about that. Real quick, I want to get to today's fast lane tip. Fast lane. What a fast lane tip is, is uh, how you can utilize laundromat resource to put you on the fast lane towards financial freedom through laundromat ownership. I just want to just, I, one thing that I am just super pumped about right now is we have a, a weekly uh, pro community call where we do a few different things. We do uh, live Q and A's. In fact, we just did a live Q and A and Andrew Cunningham, the human laundromat encyclopedia joined us. It was incredible. Uh, and he was just, uh, just, you know, like he does in, in his podcast, was, he's just spitting pure gold nuggets out for everybody to just pick up off the ground. It was great. Um, we go through deal analyses, analysis. We analyze deals, uh, actual deals that you guys are looking at. Uh, we do panel discussions on different topics. We've got a wash, dry, fold one in the works. Uh, man, there's so many good things that are happening over there. I just, I'm, I love it because it's like we come and hang out once a week on Zoom. And I'm hoping to like really bring that to in-person meetings. Uh, that is a big goal of mine for this year is to get some in-person meetings happening all around. Uh, so anyways, fast lane tip is I say it all the time, but we can go faster, we can go farther, and we can get there easier when we do it all together. And one of the cool things that happened in our most recent call besides having Andrew Cunningham with us is uh, one of the uh, pro community members was sharing how he started doing pickup and delivery because he was getting anxious to get into the business. So he just started doing pickup and delivery and he was doing laundry in his own house and then in other laundromats and he's scaling beyond that. So he's trying to figure out how to scale beyond that point now. Um, and there was just an awesome discussion where some people who have been looking for deals and haven't been able to find them are like, oh, maybe I'll just start that way too. And it was just a really cool synergy happening and uh, ideas were flowing and that's where the creative juices are going. I loved every second of it. Um, and a huge shout out to Andrew Cunningham for, for joining us also and sharing his wisdom. So fast lane tip is whether you do it in the pro community and you join our, our, uh, weekly calls, or you just get together with other laundromat owners, you know, on a zoom call or in person or whatever, regularly do it together. It doesn't matter. I'm not, I'm not trying to say you have to come do it in the, uh, in the laundromat resource community. Just find some other people who are like-minded and do it together, brainstorm, problem solve, uh, you know, and think through, okay, what are the next steps? Uh, keep each other accountable. All those things are so, so, so important uh, to help us achieve our goals. And if your goal is to leave your nine to five, if it's to have financial freedom, if it's to have, you know, just additional cash flow coming in um, on the side from your nine to five, whatever your goal is, you're going to get there faster and you're going to take it farther when you're doing it with other people. All right. I got fired up. I get fired up about that topic, but anyways, I, I'm just, I'm high off of our last call uh, in the pro community over there because it was so good. Uh, all right, let's jump into it with Ryan Shoemaker, speaking of learning from each other, and he shares a ton of practical tips, so I know you're going to love it. I'll see you on the backside of this podcast episode. Let's jump in with Ryan. Ryan, thank you for coming on the show. I'm super excited to have you on. How are you doing today? Good, Jordan. Just uh, getting through uh, eight inches of snow right now. We had a bit of a snowstorm last night. Uh we're definitely not in the West Coast, Best Coast, so we're shoveling the white stuff, uh, getting over a cold, but I'm not excited to be here. How are you? Awesome. I'm doing good. Well, it's funny. I was in Spokane, Washington last uh, last week, and they had some snow on the ground, and it was in the 20s, and I was not handling it well. So I don't know how you how you do it. Where are you, where are you located? So I am in a little town called St. Jacobs. Uh, Ontario, Canada. Uh, we are about an hour 15 west of Toronto. Uh, another perspective, we're about an, the same distance from Buffalo. 
So okay, yeah, yeah right in that southern Ontario region in the Great Lakes area. Yeah, random little side note, but I is. It's my understanding, and maybe I'm incorrect on this, but like the majority of Canadians like live right around there. Is that true? Like, it, yeah, know, it's yeah. it's similar to like the uh, where the California of Canada, <laughs> California of Canada. <laughs> Other than call, we're cold, <laughs> I'm gonna call St. Jacobs the California of Canada specifically yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're we're a very small village, <laughs> but yeah, that whole area. Yeah, it's a. Yeah. Uh, that's awesome. majority of the population. <laughs> yeah. So aside from the snow, it's pretty much indistinguishable. That's right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. Well, hey, let's jump into, uh, I mean, I want to hear about your, your experience in the industry, but tell us a little bit about who you are and weave our way into how you got into this business. All right. Sounds good. So uh, very new to the business. Uh, my wife and I closed on our laundromat November 15th of 2022. So we are baby fresh into this industry, but yeah. been on the lookout and in different process of different deals for the last year and a half, two years. My background, I'm about 25 years in the glazing industry. Uh, so I do things like frameless showers, architectural glass, wine cellars, glass service, uh, totally unrelated, but a mechanical job nonetheless. Um, worked my way up and through management. And then in 2022, I went on my own. So I'm self-employed in that industry as well. And my wife is in food service, quick food service. So she has two uh, franchise restaurants that she operates and a background as a CPA and mix all that together. And we are in the uh, rental real estate business and then decided to go into the laundromat industry. Holy cow. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that's wild. Like the glazing industry, I barely even knew that was like a thing. Right. And that's like it, your, it's a thing. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty cool. And so you went out on your own last year. How's that been yeah. going so far? Uh, great. So far. Um, it's busy enough for me, myself, and I, I haven't hired anyone yet. Yeah. Uh, and, and thankfully I haven't because now I have a laundromat to operate That's part time right. too. So, uh, <laughs> right now I'm full enough and I'm happy with where things are right now. That's pretty awesome. Well, it sounds like you guys are pretty entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial, uh, however you want to pronounce yeah. it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. With all your, your, glazing business and your restaurants and rental real estate now laundromat you got a lot going on that's pretty cool we don't take the straight road to anywhere <laughs> no no i like that though it's more scenic when you that's right when you wander around a little bit so i mean why why laundromats you've got the glazing business thing going you've got the you know the restaurants going mm -hmm. you've got rental real estate where how did laundromats factor into this so the laundromats came into the picture i'm going to say a year and a half to two years ago we started looking we actually started looking at coin operated car washes and how that came into the picture is our real estate portfolio um we don't have a lot we're a couple duplexes and condos things like that but here we have a real issue with cash flow especially in the last couple of years yeah. and we're also in an area where rent control takes place so a lot of those things just aren't bringing in the type of money that they used to and in some cases they're losing acquisitions but you know these are it's generational wealth for down the road mm -hmm. so we started looking at different businesses that we could purchase the land so we started looking at car washes um the car wash idea didn't take off the way we thought and our broker actually introduced us to the laundromat that we ended up purchasing but in the process we had gone out and put a couple offers on more local laundromats that just didn't pan out they fell through we got over the idea of purchasing the land so these are leased properties but um, that's how we ended up looking into the laundromat business Right. Yeah. And I find that a lot of people either come to laundromats through something like a car wash, self storage, or, you know, even vending or ATM machine ideas. Yep. And they wind up in laundromats a lot of times, or they're kind of looking at those things separately. They, they tend to fall in like a similar category where they're, you know, not super time intensive necessarily. They're fairly simple businesses. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and high cash flow potentially. 
uh, for yeah. those two. We looked at it for the cash flow, and I think maybe like a lot of people who begin in this, we thought maybe it was more, uh, I'm gonna quote unquote, passive income. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, learning that it's not a passive industry, like mm -hmm. it's led to believe, but it's flexible. But definitely there's a cash flow element there. And then it gives us the opportunity to explore other things. And it, I find it suits well with uh, what I'm doing anyway, because I'm a, I'm a very mechanical individual. Mm -hmm. My wife's very numbers oriented, so. Mm -hmm. To get kind of meshed together and yeah. it works well on this yeah yeah you've got that one two combo there that that ceo CF, uh, coo duo there <laughs> that can be that rocket fuel i love it i i just go with uh, i'm the blue collar <laughs> yeah uh, i'm i'm gonna view you you can't be you know anything less than coo with a beard looking like that i mean it's, <laughs> that's a great looking beard so well thank you uh yeah uh okay so uh all right so you're looking for these businesses and yep. your broker brings this laundromat deal to you can you tell us a little bit about how that went how'd you go about deciding okay this is the one we're gonna make an offer you know how, how yeah did the process go so by this time we had already had an accepted offer on a local laundromat that just fell out of due diligence. So we weren't aggressively looking at that point. It was a little bit of a blow to the system after that one just didn't pan out. But our broker came to us with this one and said, we should really investigate this further. Now it's not a local laundromat. It's an hour 15 from here. So it's about, you know, in context, 70 miles away from home. So we, wrestled with that idea but we went and took a look at it and we were honestly surprised at the size of how many machines were in there the history of the place it was 30 plus years in business and the price seemed right and we got a little bit of history about the previous owner and why they were exiting the business there was no major red flags so that's how we uh, pursued this one and even to this day, I talk to the previous owner, at least on a weekly basis, she's always there to help us. And it's a great relationship going forward. And I couldn't be happier that we did this. Yeah, that's awesome. And I, man, so I'm, I mean, I'm curious, I'm gonna ask you about owning a laundromat an hour and 15 minutes away, cause I get asked about that a lot. So we're gonna chat about that for sure. Okay. Uh, you said you were surprised at how many machines, like how, is it how big is the space? Is the space big, or are they just packed a lot of machines in there? What, what did you so, mean by that? Yeah, the square footage is just over two thousand square feet. Okay, but it's a lot of machines. Uh, talking through different distributors who have worked here in the past, uh, and this was a new term to me. But this store was originally built as a Maytag home style type store. Okay, so top loader heavy. In fact, it's Maytag majority of the equipment in there is Maytag that hasn't been changed out over the years. Um, but it was top loader heavy with 40 top loaders. And now we have six 40 pound front loaders at the back and we've introduced some other stuff here and there. And then a whole bank of small dryers. Like we have 48 dryers, some really small and then some 30 pound stacks. So a fair amount of equipment in a small space. Yeah. But top loader heavy holy cow okay all i'm hearing is you say 40 top loaders i'm hearing 40 headaches so but i, I want to know like <laughs> how has it been having a store i mean a lot of lawn owners are trying to get rid of their top loaders and some of them hang on to them because their customers like love them but yeah i mean what's what's your i mean listen nobody's going to be more qualified than the guy who owns 40 top loaders in one <laughs> store to tell us once and for all, like what's the verdict on top loaders? Do you like them? Are they okay? Have they been okay to work with? What's, what's uh, your thoughts on them? Yeah. So the a little bit of backstory, when we bought this laundromat, I'm going to say there was about seven washers that were completely dead out of commission. They're just sitting there to take up a, a spot. And there were some dryers that are dead as well. So we've been rejuvenating some of this stuff and the long-term plan is to ship these top loaders out the door as quick as possible. Okay. Uh, the previous owner did buy 10 new ones recently within the last five years. Okay. So we will probably downsize to those 10 as we slowly and as you know, income allows. 
right. replace things. I have um, some 30 pound hard mounts that are going to be coming in. Okay. So bring some of the bigger equipment to the front of the store, hide those top loaders in the back where they can collect dust. <laughs> yeah. 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 Wow. I mean, that's, that's, I mean, that's, that's great. Like all, listen, all that really matters is, you know, can you run your business, be profitable, serve your customers and, you know, if you can do that, how you're doing it right now, like that's great. And then if you have a plan to evolve the store, you know, all the better. And that's, it is a process, right? It's a, it's a long process. I mean, Rome wasn't built in a day and this won't be done in a week, but yeah. uh, there's, there was a value add component when we bought this, we knew that going in and it's going to take months, if not years to get there. And I think it'll be ever evolving, but uh, we're excited to implement some changes right away. Yeah. So, okay. So this uh, sounds like uh, the woman who was selling it was, was it on the market for a while? Did the broker bring it to you like quickly? What was it like? So the broker brought us, brought it to us quickly. Now uh, he was actually pitching it to another client of his who had just didn't fall in their umbrella, like their scope of work is it was going to need too much work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so he brought it to us. It had been on the market, I believe three to four months, okay. but not uh, publicly advertised. It was on the equivalent of Craigslist. So it was okay. just a single ad and he was the one that scoped it, researched it. And okay. It found it. So. so he wasn't even really her broker. He just found it and yeah, she had no broker. She was just okay. basically selling this thing privately. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then did you, you don't have to necessarily get into any specific numbers, but did you, did you offer like what she was asking? Was there some negotiation there? How did that play out? We did negotiate uh, based on, we had an appraisal done and based on leasehold improvements and the value of the equipment that was there, we had made an offer well, even before we got to the appraisal, we had made a an offer for less just based on the condition and <coughs> excuse me, what was needed to be done. But um, we, yeah, we went in less knowing that it was going to need some elbow grease. Yeah. So, and the nice part is our uh, previous owner was even willing to take a, a vendor take back. So she's still got some skin in the game and has motivation to make sure that this does well. So. Yeah, awesome. And for all you Yankees out there, vendor take back equivalent to seller financing. So. Yes, yeah, that's uh, seller financing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's all it's all good. Yeah. It took me a little while to figure out what uh what Canadians were talking about when they're talking about vendor take back. And I was like, I don't even know what does that mean? And I had to look it up at one point. So Is uh, it seller financing or financing? <laughs> yeah. Well it depends on where where you live, I guess. Um <laughs> here in my household. Uh, I can't really speak for all of California because everybody says I have an accent. Uh, even here in California, they're like, where are you from? And I'm like, down the road. I'm like what? <laughs> um, so I can't really speak on how things are pronounced or enunciated. I feel like I don't get a say in this. Okay. Um, well, that's good. Uh, did you have to negotiate the vendor take back or did she offer that? Like, how did that? Cause I mean, people ask me about that all the time. How do you get seller financing vendor take back? How did that work uh, out for you? So we used to simply ask that there was an option for it and she was more than happy to. She was losing this as not a primary source of income, but it was a source of income. So she was happy to have a bit of an interest payment coming her way in lieu of. So it was uh, a good fit. Yeah. And, and you know, that that is one of the reasons, you know, why a seller might offer vendor take back or seller financing is because, you know, sometimes all they really need is, you know, either a lump sum to just kind of draw down as their income or a steady income. Like if you can make a, you know, whatever the loan is a $2,000 a month payment to Mm -hmm. the owner, then sometimes that's all they really need. Right. And so you can negotiate those vendor take back seller financing deals by trying to figure out what is it that they're trying to get out of selling this laundromat and how can I help them get it in a way that makes sense for me? Um, And a lot of times you can tweak things like the interest rate or like how long you have to pay things back or, you know, all kinds of different ways to try to help them get what they want and help you get what you want um, in a way that works for both parties. And it sounds like you guys have been able to do that pretty well where she's happy, you're happy. 
everyone's happy. And I think we may have had the benefit of the markets declining too. So no one was making what they were making on their investments. So this was a, a set interest rate for 10 years. And she was happy to have that as stable income yeah. going forward. It worked yeah. out great. Yeah, that's awesome. And and a lot of times people buy these laundromats and they hold them for a long time. It's kind of their retirement plan. And so when they either can't or don't want to keep running them, it can still be their retirement plan, either by giving them a lump sum through taking a loan or buying it cash or by making them payments over time. And sometimes that's all they need. So that's awesome. Awesome input on how you got that. Cause I mean, people are always looking for vendor take back seller financing deals and, and, want to know how do I even, how do I even get that? And it was great. Cause we just, we just asked, we yeah. communicated through the broker. It was really well done and the opportunity was there. Couldn't be yeah. happier. Yeah. Number one way to find seller financing or vendor take back is ask, ask. <laughs> you, you gotta ask, you know, worst they're going to say is no. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Okay, so you guys negotiated this deal, and uh, did, uh, did you get another loan on top of that, or did you were you able to kind of make the deal happen through the vendor take back and whatever you guys brought to the table? So we brought money to the table. We did look at financing the rest of it, and we actually had gone through the process with a leasing company. Okay. But again, with the way the markets turned between the time we started the appraisal and the deal to say today's date, it didn't make sense to get locked into this lease. So we've decided that we're just going to carry it on our own for now, do a little more improvements. And then worst case scenario, if we decide we want to pull more equity out after we've done some retooling, refreshing of the place, we'll get another appraisal and then do it based on what today's value or that day's value will be. Right. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, I think a lot of people, ideal situation is it's just you and the seller and there's no, you know, banks yeah. you got to go through and all the red tape and all the, you know, all that. So that's awesome. It, it wasn't the Danny D'Angelo, no money down, but I, my heart hearts, I think it was the next best thing. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that. Uh, okay. So you got that. Uh, what about, I mean, what about your... I mean, did you have time left on the lease when you bought it from her or did you have to negotiate the lease at all? We did negotiate the lease. The um, property management company didn't want to just extend the lease. So we had to write a new lease when we took part of when we took over the place. And that was part of the due diligence process. Mm -hmm. So we negotiated a new lease and I thought we did really well on that. They were more than happy to take us on after we did our credit checks. And so we did a five plus six extension on our lease and we're happy with the rates. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, did I uh, just out of curiosity and again, you, you don't need to share numbers or anything, but did, uh, was there a, was there a bump up a significant bump up in the rent amount at that negotiation or what so did that it look did, like? It did increase, but I was able to negotiate the first two years down a little bit. Okay. Up to the year five and then stagger the increase a little bit. So we're at $11 a square foot plus the TMI right now, oh. um, making it just around $4,200 a month for the for the rent. And that's yeah. water included. We still have to pay our, our lovely gas bill, which just went through the roof and uh, the hydro yeah. electric bill. Yeah, that's water for you Yankees. And... <laughs> I'm assuming the $4,200 a month is Canadian dollars, which is what, like $250 American? Yeah, or give or take after the exchange. <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> yes, always, yes, everything's Canadian funds. Yeah, we always crack up about like, you could buy it at this at this price or this price Canadian. And it's yep. always like, <laughs> way more. Um, yeah. Of uh, okay, awesome. Yeah, thank you. No, thanks for sharing that stuff. Um, all right, so you you go through the due diligence uh, period. Did you do like coin counts and stuff or did you not do that? We did coin counts. That was okay. one of the uh, reassuring deals because the last deal we looked at, the uh, operator would not let us do uh, coin counts or any sort of on-premise training or anything. We had to do everything remotely and it was just gonna be handed the keys. So this owner, we went in, I'm gonna say five or six times. We did coin counts, we did training as we went as far as you know, operating the change machines, 
um, how the machines worked. There was vending included as part of the package. So uh, how the, the pot machine vending, the candy machines, the soap dispensing, all that stuff. And we did coin counts on everything. And yeah, it was part of the process. It, it went well. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, the uh, So I want to talk about like when you actually took over the laundromat, what that feeling was like and what you did. But real quick, the the deal that fell through before was there was there anything was there like a primary reason i mean obviously if the guys or or gal is not letting you see the laundromat or like any evidence of numbers they're giving you or something like uh, obviously that's a tough deal to swallow uh, yeah. was that what killed that deal or was there something about it that was like okay we can't go forward with this well that was the biggest one of the biggest things the second issue I had was contacting the landlord there and not getting any response. Mm. And afterwards I found out that they're, they've been playing with the idea of demolishing that whole plaza with the idea of a high rise development. Mm. So I don't think they're looking to sign a long-term lease for a laundromat anyway, mm -hmm. and just never heard back. So I think there was after no response from the landlord and hearing the future plans could be. That was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back on that deal. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that was smart. You know, pull, pull out of that deal. You know, without talking to that landlord, because I mean, you're out of luck, right? And and sadly for the that owner, they might be out of luck uh, if they, you know, it's going to be hard to sell a business that might get demolished soon. That's very asset heavy and can't be moved easily. So that's yeah. As a wise person once told me, it's not like a shoe store that you can move down the street. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that that person sounds incredibly, incredibly, incredibly wise. smart. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Throwing me off my game here. All right. So let's go back to your your laundromat that you uh, that you did buy. Yeah. Uh, thanks for sharing. You know that because I, I I think it's just as valuable to hear why you don't do a deal as it is to hear why you do a deal um, and, and do buy a laundromat. So um, yeah, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, no um, Okay, so you, you you close on this deal. Talk to me about like day one, you close on this deal, you get keys. Yeah. What are your, what, what are the thoughts and feelings running through your, your mind and your body at that point in time? So day one, you get the big massive keychain of unlabeled stuff and you hope for the best. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, thankfully, the old I literally got a bucket of keys when I a bucket of keys, the yeah, service keys, the door keys. I'm like, what is? Yeah, a every coin box is different. Yeah. Oh, here we go. Right. Funny, um, funny little anecdote about that is that's why I name. I have a like a free ebook you can download. Uh, go to the website if you're interested in it. It's called the keys to buying your first laundromat. It's kind of like a <laughs> inside joke with myself about keys and all the keys you get and stuff. Uh, funny. Oh, good. Out. Okay, so you got your big. <laughs> wad of keys got the big wad of keys walking through the door like a janitor um the owner met us there for turnover day because we uh -huh. we bought the change from the change machine so we had to get counts on that she did her last coin collection from the night before so again it was really good she was phenomenal to work with and still is to this day always there if we have questions but day one we set everything up um met the contract attendants that she had hired and started working with them, did our thing, and probably a couple hours left and did nothing but watch the cameras remotely all day just to make sure someone came in the door <laughs> and used it. Yeah. Did they? They did. They did. Okay. <laughs> I was worried. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, we opened the door. They, they came in. Uh, a side note, this is uh, not a 24-hour laundromat, but it was pre-COVID. So it was always designed to be open. Mm. Uh, since COVID came and there was contract attendance there for mask enforcement and stuff and doing the cleaning, the hours changed from 6.30 a.m. to midnight. So being that this was never designed to lock, someone always had to lock the door. And someone always had to unlock the door. Mm. So for the first week, I used to drive that 70 miles down the oh road my gosh, yeah. to unlock the door and collect coin at 6.15 in the morning. So it was leaving home at you know 
that we uh fix that quickly and put oh, a timer sorry. on the door <laughs> <laughs> that'll get old real fast you it got old fast <laughs> yeah who was locking it up for you at night when so the contract finished? attendant would lock okay. it up and set the alarm okay that's good at least you weren't having to do both i was a little nervous i wasn't doing both but yeah <laughs> yeah yeah that's yeah that's brutal so you, did you do uh like the magnetic locks on your door what did you do for the automatic door locks? so we have an electric strike installed he, in the frame uh mag locks tend to be a bit of an issue here harder to get installed we have to have them tied into the fire panel and we need engineering done mm -hmm. so we like to use an electric strike because it's just a simple easy install yeah no it, it is easy and those those magnetic locks are they're good but you also if somebody really wants to pop them open they can so depending they do a lot of damage to the doors and someone in the glazing industry i know what it's <laughs> like to replace these doors <laughs> yeah 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 i had i had some issues at one of my laundromats i had uh magnetic locks and you know i found out that people were popping that thing open and you know going and sleeping in there or drinking in there in the middle of the night and stuff when it was closed so yeah uh, you know they're they're good but you just kind of have to know that Pros and cons with everything. Pros and cons with everything. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. So that first week you're watching, I mean, that, that's, what's funny about it, right? Like you take over and then you're like, there's not really a whole lot to do. I guess there's uh, not. <laughs> yeah. I guess I'll go. I don't know. And then you, yeah. you watch cause it's exciting, right? It's exciting when you're watching somebody comes in you're like, this is awesome. Like what machine did they use? What, yeah. what do they like? How much money did they put in? How long are they in the dryer for? did they buy soap did they bring their own yeah yeah all that stuff and learning to learning the business and watching it uh on the cameras uh funny i got well not really i guess funny but so i used to do that a lot and then i started having all these well it wasn't started i was having all these problems and with my laundromat it was in really rough neighborhood and uh i i got to a point where like I dreaded opening the cameras at one point because I was like, I don't know what I'm going to see there yeah. uh, happening over there. So that's, you know, kind of a, a plus and a minus to having those cameras in the remote access over there. <laughs> I, I can the relate. We're, we're not in the best demographic either. We have a, a fair amount of homeless in that general area and we're in cold weather season. So they're looking for somewhere to be warm. Yeah. So yeah uh it's that's one of the reasons i don't think it'll ever go back to 24 hour i think we'll keep the hours of operation as is yeah but it's, yeah uh, i had things. i mean i would i went 24 hours for a while in in my long <coughs> too, and uh i eventually i had to go back to you know six to ten or or whatever we were um just for that very reason like it was just hard to keep the people there who should be there and the people not there who should be there um, yeah it's just a tough a tough thing to navigate and it's tough for an attendant to navigate too um you know to, to have to ask people to leave and especially when it's cold outside and you know we're people and empathetic and stuff and so you know it's it's tough it's a tough situation to deal with we've had a lot of hurdles on the way that we've had to learn how to navigate these problems whether it's the homeless or enforcing last load because there were some nights our we closed at noon or at midnight sorry and our attendants were leaving at 4 a.m trying to get out the Holy door cow. yeah it became a real problem so we had to do things on our end to try and relieve them out of there quicker and yeah eventually we actually took them out of the role of locking up so the door locks by itself they work until 10 p.m from 7 till 10 p.m when it is busy mm -hmm. and then we've hired a, a security company to come in and just be sure that between 12 and 12 30 everyone's got their stuff out of the dryers they're trained in crisis intervention if they have to deal with someone with mental health issues or the homeless and you know guide them out in the most correct way possible, but to still ensure that the place is secure for 1230. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. 4am. That's, that's wild. 
I, I heard the stories where they were just putting one quarter in at a time and they'd wait a minute and put another quarter in at a time and wait a minute. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's a lot of times that's, you know, people's attempt to stay the night at, you know, at the laundromat. Yeah. Um, and especially if it's cold outside, I had people do that too, where they would look, I'm doing laundry and they're not really, they just, and a lot of times they'll just come in and throw stuff in the dryer and not even wash there. And they just kind of keep the dryer running. And it's, it's just a hard situation to deal with. So I think having, taking that off your attendance plate and uh, having, you know, a professional company that that's their job to come do that is, that was probably a wise move. I think so. So far it's worked out well that we've only had one issue since we've implemented that. So yeah, it's, it's eliminated the, the quarter campers. The quarter campers. I like that term. I like that term. Um, all right. So you took over, you are watching the cameras. How, I mean, did things play out the way that you anticipated they play out? Like was, was the, the revenue, what you expected it to be? Yeah. Um, so you took over. The revenue was, I'm going to say within 10% what we expected it to be. Uh, We knew just from historical data, looking at the finances, we were going into slow season. Mm -hmm. So we knew the numbers were going to drop and they have, but not drastically that we're paranoid. We've had a couple days where it's, you know, oh my God, what's going on? But then they make up at the end. Uh, But so, no, I mean... Again, credit to the previous owner, full disclosure on what the finances were, and they were accurate with them. So we were well conditioned to what we were expecting going into. What kind of uh, what kind of <coughs> um, books did you get? Like, was the previous owner good at keeping books, or was I, I've seen the gamut, right? I've seen the napkins, so you know, <laughs> numbers written on napkins, and I've seen like you know, thorough spreadsheets or, uh, you know, printouts from software reports uh, yeah. of accounting. So I've seen and everywhere in between, right? So what was yeah. it for you? Did did she have good accounting or were you kind of trying to piece things together? Great accounting. And actually it was almost overwhelming with how much information. Her sister took care of the bookkeeping mm-hmm. and like so detailed too. It was, like washer revenue versus dryer revenue versus soap machine revenue versus vending machine A revenue, vending machine B, pop machine. It was, yeah, a very detailed, specific, and we knew how, when they collected, how they collected, audited, uh, or auditing capabilities on the change machine. So we knew everything was on the up and up. Yeah, that's awesome. Cause you don't get that a whole lot, uh, no. but I, I always say like one of the ways to increase the value of your laundromat, if you're even ever thinking about selling it is keep really good books. Um, Absolutely. You know, when you keep good books, people feel confident that they're getting what they think they're getting. So they're willing to pay a little more and it makes it financeable a lot of times with, you know, like a bank loan or an SBA or something like that. If you have good books, everything matches up. SBA feels much more confident to be able to lend on that, which means people can usually pay more for your laundromat. So, and Agreed. not to mention it's, it's just easier to keep track of your own business and to make good business decisions when you have all the data, right? I heard stories from previous owners or like through the staff, like we have a repair man who comes weekly. He's, I, I swear he came with the building. He was just another piece of furniture, a fixture. <laughs> yeah. And he's been in this, it, with this actual business for 17 years. So we, I heard the horror stories from him of, you know, 20% off the top, 30% off the top would go in people's pockets. And mm-hmm. it, we can't operate like that. We have loans to pay and debts to pay and overhead to cover. So it's all, all above board. And we're actually hoping to integrate hybrid payment systems, whether it's pay range or some other card option just so just i'm not afraid to <clears throat> disclose the revenue i just want to be able to increase the revenue decrease the amount of time i need to go down and make sure the change machine's working mm-hmm. take a little stress off that and less time collecting coin quarters are heavy 
Yeah. How often are you going to collect the coin? At least three times a week. It's a lot of time in the car. Well, the first time, well, the first month we were probably going five to six a week. Some of that was just the excitement of owning it. Totally. But the, the first week I had the change machine go down at nine o'clock at night. So I had to drive down there with the keys and unjam the coin slot. Yeah. Well, that, yeah, that, I mean, that's the, that's the downside, right? Of owning far away is it's not so bad if you're going to maybe three times a week and yep. you know, you got a good audio book or like a really good podcast about long really nights. good podcast uh, <laughs> or, you know, like, and you can, you can plan when you want to go, right. You can go yep. like here in LA, like I try to go off traffic times, right? Yeah. It's, it's the times where you have to go. That's unplanned where you're like, why did I do this so far away? You know, it's like nine o'clock at night. I got to hop in my car and I'm in my car for almost three hours, you know, just yeah. getting there and back. So that's, that's when it's tough. We had a snowstorm over Christmas where the round trip was six hours Oh my gosh. to do it. And you know, that's tough, but every, every little bit of opportunity we take in there, we're trying to automate things to take that pressure away from us, whether it's enabling pay range down the road on some of the machines, um, upgrading the change machines, like new bill acceptors. So it wouldn't go down as much. We have a second change machine just to take pressure off. If one goes down, there's another one there mm -hmm. that it still operates. The door locks being on the timers, <clears throat> just the small things that are going to help. Eventually, we want to introduce like the Alexa in there to run the music and to give warnings when last load is run specials that way. Just as much as we can to automate the experience there is going to help us run it more efficiently and ideally give a, a better quality experience to the customers that come in. Yeah. And I think having like, you know, uh, a system like a card system or something like that, that it will allow you to manage a little easily, easier remotely, take, take the pressure off the quarters situation. Like mm -hmm. if a machine goes down at nine o'clock at night, you don't have to go down that night because there's another option to pay, right? Exactly. Like you pay in a different way. Um, or being able to remote start a machine if, um, you know, if attendance not present and something happens with the machine, you can start it yeah. from home and not have to go down there, send your attendant down there. Um, you know, all that uh, automation, which is cool. I mean, there's more and more automation options coming into our industry, which is making it, you know, easier for us as owners to manage our businesses, but also making it easier, more convenient, more options for our customers to be able to use our businesses, right? Which exactly ideally makes it more profitable for us and a better experience for our customers too. Yeah. yeah. And, and redundancy, I mean, you kind of mentioned redundancy. That's the other, you know, big factor, especially managing you know, you're not remote, but managing far away is having those redundancies, having the second changer, you know, instead of hiring one or two full time or, or whatever employees having three or four that do part time hours, you know, so that if one can't make something, you have other options to kind of get through, you know, stuff like that, that kind of redundancy can really help you manage uh, any laundromat, but especially one that's, you know, further away like that. The staffing is the next goal. I mean, we're trying to outsource as much as we can. Um, we're looking right now, our our attendants work a split shift, 11 to one in the morning to do like a clean and then seven to 10 at night, that's during the week. And then on the weekends, it's uh, about 10 hours attended. So from 12 to four, and then from six to 12 depending on how busy it is, we kind of leave that loose. But we are looking at even just doing a, having a commercial cleaner take care of the mornings where there's not the traffic and they can just concentrate on cleaning the machines, cleaning the floors, cleaning touch surfaces, and then leave more of the attendance hours towards the evening when it is busier. Yeah. Are you doing any kind of uh, like laundry drop off service or wash and fold service? No, um, not at this point. It's something I would like to look into. Our facility just, it's not built in a way to 
store material. And as much as pickup delivery, I would love the distance for me to do the driving. If you know we had a driver calling sick, might it might be too time consuming for me to do it, especially with my other business. Mm -hmm. But I definitely would love to explore a wash and fold option. We actually toyed with the idea of automated lockers where they could pay online, pay on their phone, the deposit in the locker, you get a text message that your laundry is ready to pick up and no one ever has to handle any money or see anyone face to face. You just pick it up, drop off, whatever. And then t attendants could take care of it when the time is right. Mm -hmm. Is that something you're still looking into or did you opt out of that? Well, I haven't opted out of that. It's the idea of having a a reception area where we would have an attendant with you know bags of laundry in the back and like a manual ticket process. We're not we don't have the space to do something like that. But I do think a bank of automated lockers with you know twenty slots that an attendant could take it out, wash it, put it back, and never have to worry about collecting coin or collecting payment mm -hmm. or being there for pickup or drop off. I think that's still an option we'd like to explore. Yeah. Yeah. I know. So if anyone be... knows of that system somewhere, that would be great to hear. <laughs> yeah. 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 And reach out to Ryan. Uh, if you have that system, uh, I don't want sure. to reinvent the wheel, but I think we're onto something. <laughs> there are no, there are systems like that for sure. I I'm blanking on, uh, I know two different one. I, I think laundry locker might be, one of them um there's another one too and i'm blanking on the name but there is there is that system uh awesome. it's like a, a automated locker system so perfect yeah for sure uh okay so uh if if you if you were to do it all over again would you still buy this laundromat being an hour and 15 ish minutes away 70 miles away um would you, would you still buy it Knowing what I know now, absolutely. Knowing what you know now, yeah. <clears throat> Why? Um, the the value at the the potential's there. So I'm as I automate the process, it's every day is easier to manage. It's working well, and truthfully, I look at that corridor drive and I think of all these other towns I drive through, and now I think, well, if something else comes for sale in that distance, I'd be more than happy to buy something along that way. And who knows if I, the stars align, maybe we own three or four that direction and you make a full day of it and stop in at each one. Yeah. So I, I, the distance will always be a factor, but I think we've done good measures to overcome it. And I think by coming up with those procedures and the automation, it gives us the opportunity to look outside our geographical area, look at different ones. Yeah. Yeah. Just don't do what I did where I bought, you know, a little far away. I was like 40 minutes away. And then I just keep moving further away <laughs> somehow. I don't know how that works, but. Ironically, we looked at another one, the same distance away, the opposite direction. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what I was afraid you were going to say. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So are you buying that one or? No, no. How much of a glutton for punishment are you? Well, apparently I'm a big sucker for it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, are you, I, obviously you're you're pretty new in it. So this is kind of end of January when we're doing this uh, interview right now. So you're just like three months into this thing, right? So pretty new yeah. there. Are you, are you looking for other ones now or are you just trying to nail down your your systems processes at your original one. And if one fell in your lap, maybe you look at it. Where are you at with I, that process? I'm not out aggressively looking, mm -hmm. but I'm definitely looking at the local laundromats that are you know, zombie mats or have been left unattended. And even some of the nicer ones, I'd be lying if I said I didn't send an email to uh, info at uh -huh. just to see if there was any option to sell. So I'd love to grow this part of the business and do other laundromats. I do think, especially in this model, there's benefit in volume, mm -hmm. whether it's for sharing resources as staff or repair people or parts. I, I think it's a, 
a definitely a, a copy paste thing. Once you've done it once, I think it's easily repeatable. So I'd like yeah. to keep looking for more. Uh, so you bought this laundromat for a cash flow play, right? I mean, has yes. has it panned out that way for you? Is it are you happy with the cash flow that you're getting now? Is it something where you're like, okay, we are building it into the cash flow machine that we want it to be? How how has that played out for you? Because that was the original goal, I think. So it does cash flow. It carries itself and then some, but there's definitely room to improve it. And that's when we started looking at let's eliminate the dead top loaders. Let's eliminate some of the lower value equipment and start bringing in some hard mounts. So I was able to purchase recently three uh, 30 pound hard mounts that I, I'm having bases made for right now. And I want to bring our 40 pound hard mounts that are way at the back 40 of the store front and center mm -hmm. and start gradually replacing things with the harder mounts to increase the vent prices and go from there and just phase some of the other stuff out. I don't think we'll ever be without a top loader. Mm -hmm. It's the demographic still requires it, mm -hmm. but it is the funny thing we realized is our six 40 pound machines do nearly the same dollar volume as the other 40 that are sitting there. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, the market's telling us what needs to happen. Yeah. And you might need to even look at some bigger ones too. If they're doing that much, you know, go to those sixties or even eighties down the line. I'd love some, to. Yeah. If, if the right options. opportunity comes, I would definitely look at some really big machines that then I would also have to invest in some dryers to kind of complement those big right. machines as well. So yeah, that's the downside. It's kind of a little bit of a domino effect when you start, especially if you're taking like a store with like 40, top loaders and you're talking about adding, you know, more 40s or 60s or 80s in there, you, you've got to kind of match your wash capacity and your dry capacity, uh, you know, closer. You can't just upgrade one because then you're going to run out of dryers and not have enough, you know, capacity for, for your customers there and it's going to bottleneck you. So it is something to think about for sure. It's a tough balance. And again, a lot of our dryers are the really small, these home style dryers. Mm -hmm. So as things get replaced, those will be the first to go. Yeah, They're near the front of the store already. So it would be nice to have bigger dryers complement bigger washers. And yeah. at least from the street view, it's a good perception. Looks like a good experience and it's nice and clean and yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's the game plan. That's it's, it's exciting plan. too. I mean, it's it's exciting obviously to get get the business, get in there, start making it your own, but it's also exciting to have like a plan that you're working towards and um and, and start working towards it and start getting it there. Uh you have a timeline on those 30 pounders when they're going to get in? Uh I'm hoping by mid February, I'm expecting a good slow period there mm -hmm. where I can start relocating some of the machines and for two or three days work on bringing the 40 pounds up, moving the thirties around and then start pushing some of those machines back. So, <clears throat> excuse me, that's the timing that we're looking at is kind of mid February while everything's nice and slow. Yeah. Out of curiosity, why did you opt for the buying 30 pounders? Uh, truth be told, I found them on Facebook marketplace from a local laundromat who was upgrading to some Dexters that were sold to them used a couple hours up the highway. So uh -huh. not a major investment. It's all used machinery right now until we develop a little more cash flow. But at this point, I just figured the thirties were there. They have a nice appearance. They complement the forties. We already have the same manufacturer. So I thought the deal was right that we'd start with that and then hopefully look at newer equipment in the long term. Yeah, awesome. I mean, hey man, the opportunity comes about and you can replace some of those top loaders relatively inexpensively and kind of upgrade them, increase your capacity. Yeah, jump on that all day. Absolutely. Awesome. Uh, so talk to me a little bit about, I mean, you got the, the one, two power combo between you and your wife. Is she, is she doing much in the business? Are you doing most of the stuff? How's that playing out between you guys? Uh, she definitely is the numbers person. So 
I bring the coin back. She counts it. She does all the change machine stuff. I do the physical visits three okay. times a week. She will come once a week and she's kind of taken the vending under her. Okay. Her umbrella, but she's definitely the, uh, the financing HR and the vending department, anything, uh, mechanical or daily collections or change machine filling that that's, that's on me. Yeah. Yeah. She's not turning the wrench on the machines. She won't be turning the wrench. Okay. All right. <laughs> she just turns the profits. <laughs> she turns the profits. I like it. You turn the wrenches. She turns the profits. This is, that's this is, right. Man, this is an amazing show already. Uh, <laughs> dude, that's cool. Uh, I, does she like going to the laundromats? She does. Um, the laundromat? Yeah. She, she uh, does enjoy it. Obviously with her restaurants, they take a lot of time. Totally. I mean, I, I don't think it's a secret labor right now is tough so those are demanding for her and then she also has um she's caring for her mom right now who is battling with cancer so oh, sorry that takes that. a lot of time as well but no she does like going she likes to try and get there once a week and take care of that vending and and she's super clean so he can't get her in there for more than three minutes without rags and cleaners and scrubbing every surface okay. that's a good quality to have when you're in laundromat Absolutely. I, yeah. I I do it. I wish I could do it as much as she does. So, yeah, I feel like I'm I'm a little bit blind to uh, like, I don't know. I tell my wife, like, I just have a higher chaos tolerance. And so I don't see like messes or dirt or like like the little corners. I never I'm not I'm not like a detail person. I'm not looking in the little corners and seeing, you know, the dirt and stuff. You need somebody who's like detail oriented to be checking that stuff out. You do because I'm blind to that too. So we're a blended family. So between us, we have four kids uh -huh. ranging from nine to 22. Okay. Um, so I, I've got pretty good at ignoring the messes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's a good quality to have when you got kids in the house. Uh, yes. I feel like my daughter is a little tornado and just wherever she goes, you can see the path. I'm like, Oh, oh yeah. Gosh. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. Uh, yeah. That's awesome. Um, all right, so we have a segment of the podcast called Down to Business. Uh, let's get down to business. Over and out. And that's where we could just hear a little bit of details about your business. So let's jump in. Well, real quick, how, how many hours do you think you're spending on like working on the laundromat? And obviously, I mean, you're driving and stuff. So you, you got a lot of hours invested in this laundromat. Yeah, so I would say including the drive time, and I try and coordinate the drive time that I'm doing something for my primary business too. Um, the work at night with you know counting coin, getting the deposits ready. I'm going to say it probably takes about 15 hours a week. Okay, counting the drive time. Counting the drive time. Yeah. 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 That's uh, that's really good. I mean, I. Obviously, like I get asked this all the time, like, you know, a lot of people with full time jobs or a lot of people with, you know, their own other businesses and stuff. And they're like, well, what am I committing to here? What's, you know, what, what's, how, how much time am I looking at here? And, you know, my general answer is a lot of times it's going to be a little bit more upfront, you know, because you're learning the business and you're, you know, watching the cameras because you're excited yeah. and, you know, trying to, you know, make it your own and all that stuff. But once you're, once you're in there, you can really run them, especially if it's just a self-serve business, you can really run them on very minimal time. Um, yeah. so that's, I mean, that's good to hear you're going out there two, three times a week. And with yep. all that drive time, you're looking at 15 hours. That's pretty good. Typically Monday I go out, collect from the weekend. Wednesday I go out, I meet my repair guy cause he's there every Tuesday night overnight. It works through till Wednesday afternoon. So I meet with him see how status of the equipment if we need to order anything and then depending on kids schedules whether they're playing hockey or whatever i either go on the friday or i'll go on the saturday and just make sure change machines topped up for a busy weekend yeah yeah hockey the surfing of the canadian <laughs> california that's right You're right <laughs> our, our our water's just frozen <laughs> yeah that's right so it's basically the same thing basically the same yeah. <laughs> different state of matter um how 
how long were you looking into laundromat specifically? I know you were looking at like car washes and stuff, but how long were you looking into laundromat specifically before you landed this one? So I would say we were probably looking at laundromats and then went into a contract on the first one a year prior to this. Okay. What, what took a year? Was it the deal flow? Was it, you were discouraged by that first one and we're like, eh, I don't know about laundromats or what, what took a year? So our demographic down here just doesn't have a lot of laundromats. Mm -hmm. So the one that was local to us, which I found out later, wasn't even with the whole issue with the landlord not getting back and not getting coin counts. We found out afterwards from our distributor because he used to own it. Mm -hmm. It never did well anyway, because it was next to residences at the universities and they had subsidized laundry through the school. Uh, mm -hmm. So he said the best, the only thing that ever happened, they'd come over and break their twenties and take the change and go over to back to the residence and do their laundry. Yeah. So uh, we weren't discouraged. Just, there wasn't a lot on the market. Mm -hmm. What we did see through listings were some uh, operations like downtown Toronto. So again, we're the hour 15 hour and a half away, but Think of it as, you know, heavy downtown LA traffic the whole way. Mm -hmm. And they were going for high dollar value and just more than I could absorb at that point. So we were just, we had a small window. We were looking at dollar value for machines and then this came up. Yeah. The opposite so, direction. Yeah. Right. After you fell out of escrow on that first one, that deal fell through. Did you can continue looking for laundromats were you did you go back to looking for car washes and stuff too were you kind of open to like what business or were you still looking for laundromats only what was that like so in between that first one falling through and this one we had looked at another one and we had um a due diligence process again this was another one that was an hour and a half north the opposite direction okay. this one came with the dirt but it was a smaller laundromat, standalone building, but also had a two bay self-serve car wash out back. Ah, best of so, both worlds. Best of both worlds. The owner was retiring. He had three locations up in that area and he was starting to eliminate uh, his yeah, operations. So yeah. So we looked at that one. Um, biggest issue was our lenders wanted phase two environmental on the land. Mm -hmm and the seller just wasn't willing to go that far with it. He was looking for a cash buyer to take it over. Got it. Yeah. They want phase two because of the car wash. Is that? Yeah. Because of yeah. the car wash. Yeah. That's normally not a laundromat thing. Usually it's dry cleaner or car wash or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. No dry cleaning on site or anything, but because yeah. the car wash, car wash and the vacant lot behind, I yeah. thought a phase two would be necessary. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I, okay. Uh, granted, this is going to be Canadian dollars, but you know, what, uh, what does it cost to do laundry in St. Jacobs? Well, actually, so the laundromat's in London, Ontario. Oh, London, London, okay. London, Ontario. Are you, so I, my, you're in, St. I commute Jacobs from St. Jacobs, the laundromat's to London. in London. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So what's it cost to do laundry in London, Ontario, so Canada? Our, our Canadian funds, our top loaders are 275. Okay. Our small front loaders that we do have a few of are 375. And our 40 pounds start at $8. And then you can get the additional power, power wash and then go up to like 925. Yeah. Our small dryers run uh, 25 cents for five minutes okay. and our larger ones are 25 cents for four. Okay. You just pay by the minute or by the four five yeah. minutes per quarter. Yeah. We don't have a full cycle option yeah. right now. We will look at it depending on how these gas prices tend to go. Literally not much different than California. We saw a 110% increase on the last bill. Yeah. So... Yeah, they're not they're not looking good here right now. So no, like through through the roof. I think my our personal gas price seven x over like from one month to the next somehow. I don't That's know. Crazy, insane. Hopefully not a gas leak. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, 
So, I, I, you mind sharing? Like, can we talk about like what? How many turns per day are you doing with all these like forty top load washers? Do you yeah, keep track so of that I, we do actually. Okay. So the newer top loads obviously do the best, mm -hmm. and on average, I'm going to say we see three to four turns a day during the week. Uh, weekend, we'll rip up a little more, and definitely our forty pound machines, the larger ones in the back, they they see the volume on the weekends where we can see five to six turns a day. It may be on a Sunday afternoon and the weather's nice. You might get a bit more too, but that's pretty good. It, yeah. We're, we're happy with the volume that we go through. That's a lot, a lot of work for those, uh, workhorse top loaders there. Uh, yeah, I know <laughs> that's a lot of water going through there too. A lot of water, a lot of belts, <laughs> a lot of belts. Yeah. A lot of belts. <laughs> that's funny. You've only been in three months or so and you're you're already with the belt we know the part numbers for yeah. hipsch belts now <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> uh that's funny uh and then you said you're partially attended right you got split shifts going and yeah you may have you may go with a with a uh janitorial service or something later down the line yeah i think we are one of the things is we inherited the staff that were there um how was that it's it's a uphill battle yeah. So the previous owner really left them to their own devices to kind of run it as they saw fit. Right. And now that we're trying to improve and implement some changes, there's some pushback on, you know, we've yeah. always done it this way. We always hear that it's, we've always done it this way. There's nothing wrong with that. And by trying to optimize the hours and, you know, yeah. turn it is, profit. It, yeah. It is tricky when you have a staff, especially when they're, minimally supervised beforehand and you want to change the way you do things and you know i've found that sometimes you just have to let people go and start fresh because it's it's the whole tough to teach an old dog new tricks or tough to expect more from somebody than they've been giving you know especially yeah. if they've been there for a while and you know i had you know employees who really pushed back on you know, doing a little more thorough cleaning than they had been doing before and, you know, doing some of those tasks like cleaning lint traps every day they weren't doing. And they were like, ah, we don't want to do that. And I'm like, well, yeah, either do it with a smile or I'll go find somebody else who does. <laughs> or, yeah. yeah. Like it's got to happen. Like it, it has to happen. So it has to happen. So yeah. we're, we're dealing with that right now. That's probably the biggest hurdle we have right now is, the staff so yeah. the more we can contract out to janitorial services security services and minimize the amount of attendant re requirements the better because yeah. again yeah cleaning is one of the things that just i don't think ever happened as frequently as it needed to in the previous five years of ownership right. and it's we're trying to push the cleaning and uh I, I would just say they were just given too much free reign yeah like access to the cameras and to the back office and certain things just need to be brought back a little bit yeah yeah i've also i've also seen and talked with people who you know i think it's generally best practice anyways but i think a lot of times people don't do this where they you, it's probably wise if you're taking over a laundromat with a new staff to change out all the coin boxes because you don't know who has keys and a lot of times owners give an attendant the key if they go on vacation or something and you yeah. know so that that kind of thing can happen a lot too um so yeah and, and that's that's extra difficult to navigate when you're far away right the it's distance to... makes it tough because you can't just drop in on your way home from doing groceries and just see the state of affairs there right so yeah. you, you rely on the technology and the cameras and, yeah. and, and thankfully even the previous owner is so good that she's even willing to drop in and communicate things back to us too. Yeah. That's good. That's good to have that, that relationship yeah. there. Um, and then you are a coin only store right now, but potentially looking into adding a digital payment system. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely on the short list of things to do is, add another form of payment how we haven't decided which one 
heavily looking in the pay range just because of the upfront cost is much more minimal than converting everything to a full card system. Um, but we'll we'll see how things go. But that's definitely on the short list of things to do. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing about your business and even some of the struggles. Like I know it's, you know, tough, especially when you're kind of in the thick of it to be sharing about the struggles that you're you're having with like staff and, you know, stuff like that. But I think that's super helpful, you know, to help give new people a realistic uh, perspective on what, you know, might happen when you take over a laundromat, but also, you know, for other people like me to be able to empathize with you and be like, <laughs> okay, I'm not the only one, you know, who's struggling with, with that stuff. It, They're real helpful. world problems. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, all right, we have another segment of the podcast called Secret Sauce. Listen up, it's the secret sauce. And Secret Sauce says, hey, what piece of advice do you have for people who currently own laundromats that, uh, you know, that might help them with their business? Something you see working maybe in your business? I'm assuming your Secret Sauce is gonna be add more top loaders to your laundromat. <laughs> more top loaders. You can't buy enough of them. You cannot can't buy, buy enough. Them. 40 buy bare enough. minimum. Bare 40 <laughs> bare minimum. Put, you put them outside just so people yeah, can walk exactly. by and use them too. <laughs> exactly. I like that actually. Yeah. I like that. Uh, the de we're definitely, um, what's improving our business is the redundancy factor. So the change machines working flawlessly, using the technologies, upgrading things to be reliable and using different contracts, whether it's the contract security or looking at uh, contract janitorial, things to automate and alleviate as much pressure as we can off of us doing the day to day. Some things will never go away, but we try and harness the other services, technology, and upgrades as much as we can. Like, as stupid as it sounds, that door timer and electric strike probably saved our relationship because I'm not going seven days a week at 4 a.m. to unlock the door and then still run my job full time. So yeah. just the small little things made a huge difference. So uh, technology, definitely the way to go. Between And there's lots of it out there and it's growing every day. Uh, the resources are out there, you know, YouTube, Facebook, the podcast, and what people are doing to make this work. And it's, it's endless. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that. I mean, I think the, you know, like you said, there's more and more technology to help us automate and manage our businesses. And, you know, we should be, should be taking advantage of it and we should be sharing what, what we're doing. And I see a little bit of that happening online. Uh, we should be sharing more about how we're automating. And that's why I think, you know, talking to talking to you in this interview, like this has already been really awesome because it's, it's shared your experience, but it's also, I mean, it's filled with like practical stuff that you're doing. Like, how are you navigating owning a laundromat an hour and 15 minutes away? And there's just, you've shared a ton of like really practical things. So. <laughs> This, but this kind of thing is awesome. And the more that we do that and the more that we share, here's how we're automating, here's some tools that we can use, all that stuff, you know, the better for, for all of us. So I love that secret sauce, great advice. Thank you, absolutely. We have another segment called Pro Tips. Pro Tips. And Pro Tips is what advice do you have for someone, what advice do you have for yourself you know, like four or five months ago, you know, the, the person who's trying to buy their first laundromat and trying to get into this business, any advice for them? First thing to do if you're looking to get into business is listen to all the laundromat, laundromat resource podcasts. <laughs> yes. Ah, you and I so did. so wise. You are just so I, wise. I listened to everything from current right back to episode one and so many golden nuggets through that. And really, the information's out there on the internet. Uh, join the Facebook forums, check out the YouTube videos, whether it's um, watching what Joe Dan does at Splash Em Out. Uh, the, I, I love watching what Keenan does on Following Keenan or Hot Dogging with Dan. These are guys that are small mom and pop operators that have harnessed technology 
in an affordable way to make these businesses operate. This, it's out there. And don't be afraid to ask questions on the forums. There's, if you're think, if you think you're the only one that has that question, you're not. Either someone's in that same position as you right now, or someone knows the answer because they've been there and done it. Mm -hmm. So the forums are absolutely helpful. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, you know, I think what it comes down to is a, do, do your research and, and network with other people who are where you want to be, right? Like that's, yeah. that's what it's all about. And I mean, I think that's solid, solid pro tip for anybody trying to get in really into any thing, any hobby, business, whatever, like, yeah, do your research as much as you can get some different perspectives and network with people who are, who are doing it and, you know, get the real down to earth. What does it really take? to own a laundromat yep. an hour and 15 minutes away, right? Like how, how do you actually do that? Is that even possible? Is it recommended, well, you know? <laughs> I, you don't have to follow my way. I jumped out of the plane and built the parachute on the way down. But now there's, I mean, my little bit of information is out there. There's lots of people who do this from afar. There's, there's ways to do it. If you have the, the inclining or the, the question or the idea, someone's done it yeah it's out there yeah awesome awesome pro tip uh last little segment we have which we kind of already talked about but uh what are some recommended resources you have to help people grow themselves personally or their businesses well absolutely um <clears throat> again the internet's great for all this the forums and the youtube the podcasts i download every possible podcast out there whether it's laundromat resource or other ones um Dave Men's book was great. I read that, Laundromat Millionaire. Um, so if you like to read, there's a good, it's an easy read. If you like to listen, use the podcast. Those are good resources. If you're a visual person, you can spend hours on YouTube following the journeys of other people who have done this. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. I'll put links to, to all this stuff, to some of the YouTube channels that you mentioned, uh, you know, Joe Dan Reads and following Keenan. I'll put links to that. I'll put links to uh, Facebook groups that you can jump in on. I'll put links to Dave's book, uh, Laundromat Millionaire, if you want to grab that. Um, I'll give, you know, links to all that stuff because it's right. I mean, you're right. Like you can find so much information out there. And, and a lot of this stuff, which is really kind of funny, actually, almost everything you mentioned is pretty new within like the last two years. Uh, that yeah, this stuff yeah. is coming out. All those YouTube channels, pretty new. You know, this podcast, pretty new within the last two, two and a half years. You know, Dave's, Dave's stuff within the last year or two, you know, even a lot of the Facebook groups, didn't really catch on till the last year or two. And so all that stuff's pretty new. So it's, there's more information out there than ever right now. So if you're looking to get into this business or grow your business, dig in, man, dig in. Everything's current that's out there. It's almost like this industry did nothing for 30 years. And then two years ago, just blew the doors off itself. Yeah, that's exactly, I think what happened. I, and I think that's why like this podcast and, and you know, other, other channels similar they like have really taken off and, and kind of surprisingly quickly uh, is because our industry was just stagnant. There was no new content flown into here for decades, <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. And, and now people are like, okay, well let's share, let's, let's share stuff. And I think it's nothing but good for us as business owners and for our industry as a whole, to be sharing this stuff, to be talking to each other, to be talking about, hey, how are you navigating this? Here's how I'm navigating it. Let's meld them together and find the best way for both of us to manage. You know what I mean? Like it's it's raising it's raising the level of all of our businesses, and I think it's only a good thing for our industry and for our bottom lines too. Absolutely. I mean, no, I, I saw it on Dave Men's podcast. No one gets poor by giving. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Totally true. Uh, so yeah, I think awesome resources that you recommend. Again, I'll put links to everything. If you're on YouTube, they'll be down below. If you are listening on the podcast, they'll be on the show notes, uh, page for this episode. So 
Listen, Brian, this has been incredible. Uh, really cool to hear your story and how you got into this business and really cool to hear. I mean, for me, the highlights were hearing how you're navigating owning this laundromat from an hour and 15 minutes away and some of the steps that you're taking to help ma make managing that uh, a lot easier because that is I, I know from experience, you know, managing and owning a laundromat that far away is it can be challenging and tough and there's some unique obstacles to overcome, but really cool to hear how you're navigating that. So I appreciate you coming on and sharing. I have one more question for you. Um, I think a lot of people are going to really resonate with this episode. And I think a lot of people are going to want to hear more about, you know, your experience getting into the business and also your experience owning at a distance. And I, I say that because I get asked all the time, like, can I own a laundromat an hour, hour and a half, two hours away? You know, is that, you know, and a lot of people will advise, Hey, don't do that. Can you do that? Yes. Uh, and so I think a lot of people have questions for you. So what's the best way if somebody wants to, you know, talk to you more about laundromats or they want to hear your top beard grooming tips, uh, <laughs> or they just want to, you know, have some solidarity, solidarity with you because they're also Canadian or whatever. There we uh, go. You know, how, Absolutely. How, how can people get in contact with you? Well, to answer all that, where there's a Ryan, there's a way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> You can get a hold of me. Uh, my email address is nothing special. It's Ryan, R Y A N, dot shoemaker, S H O E M A K E R, at mail.com, not Gmail, like Gmail without the G. Awesome. Uh, you, you can follow me on LinkedIn. It's uh, LinkedIn.com forward slash Ryan Scott Shoemaker or you can just search my name. That's more about my glazing business, but there'll definitely be some laundromat nuggets that drop here and there. And my cell, if you want to phone or text, 519-498-1030. And on that note, I would love to hear from other laundromat owners, operators in the Southwestern Ontario area. Uh, I think we're underrepresented and I'd love to have a, a bit of a, even a monthly meetup where we could share our own resources or be able to buy and sell equipment from each other or anything. I know even just in the Facebook groups, I've been trying to help people find repair people mm -hmm. in the Toronto area. And it's, I think we're under service and I think a, a monthly meetup would do us all a lot of good. And, if nothing else, it's just an excuse to go eat dinner. That's right. I will, I will help you put that together too. And I will, I will put that out there to all, you know, my audience and see, you know, here on the podcast, but I'll put that out on all my channels to see uh, if there's more, I mean, I know there are other people, I, I've done tons of consulting with people in, uh, in that area. So I know there's other people, you know, in the audience who are in that area that would love to get together. So I'll help you put that together too. And uh, that's awesome. I love that. That's a great idea. We should be doing more of that uh, as owners getting together um, and talking shop and, and just I, getting to know I, each other too. Yeah. Yeah. I think on a national, but more importantly, on a regional level, we need mm -hmm. to know who's in our backyard and yep. not think of them as competition, but as our neighbor and help each other out. Yep. I love that. I love that. Well, I will have all that information that he just shared on how to get in contact with them. Again, if you're on YouTube, it'll be down below. If you are listening to the podcast, it'll be in the show notes page. So go there or uh, just rewind and write it down yourself. Don't be lazy. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, just kidding. Uh, uh, Ryan, this, is, this has truly been awesome. It's been really, really cool. Thank you so much for giving up some of your time. I know you've got multiple businesses going. You've got a lot going on. You probably got to get on the road, you know, at some point to go somewhere because you, all your stuff is out in the world there. Uh, but I appreciate you taking the time to, uh, you know, stay warm indoors with me a little bit and share your story and share your experience and wisdom that you've gained owning laundromats. Appreciate it, man. Thank you. Happy to be on and happy to have a break from the snow for a little while. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And if you are in, you know, Ontario, Canada region, reach out to Ryan, reach out to me and I'll put you in touch with Ryan and, uh, keep an eye out for a meetup because, uh, we will try to 
you know, put something together there. That'd be awesome. All right. I hope you loved that episode with Ryan. I'm sure you got a ton of great stuff out of it. I know I did. I've got tons of notes over here. In fact, I was just looking at them because, you know, every single week I challenge you and I challenge myself, pick one thing, at least one thing, put it into action. It's the action that's going to help you achieve your goals. So pick something from this episode, something you learned, something he said, uh, something that, you know, just sparked in your mind because of this conversation, whatever, pick one thing, put it into action this week, and then maybe go share it on the forums at laundromatresource.com slash forums uh, for that accountability and for further brainstorming, go chime in on each other's ideas. Uh, I just, I think that's a really powerful way to, to do it. So if, you know, if that's something you're into, go do that. But anyways, pick one thing, put it into action. So for me, it's a little abstract. The thing that I picked, I was looking through the notes and you know what I loved about it. He was talking about, I I had asked him why he decided to do laundromats and he started talking about how there was rent control and there's less, uh, less cash flow, um, happening in real estate where he normally uh, invests and he was looking for more cash flow. And this, you know, we talk about this kind of all throughout the interview is, is a cash flow play, you know, and, and I asked him how it played out and all that stuff. But the thing that kind of sparked in me is he was clear on what the goal was with his laundromat when he bought it, right? That why behind the action. And for me, and maybe a challenge for you is, you know, no matter where you're at on your journey, you know, whatever the next step might be, you know, think about the why you're doing it and make sure the next step is going to help you accomplish your goal in line with that why, right? He could say, Hey, my goal is cash flow and go buy a Lamborghini, the same amount of money he bought his laundromat. And it doesn't help him accomplish his goal. I mean, yes, he's going to look a lot cooler, but it doesn't help him accomplish his goal. Uh, so, you know, being clear on that why, and you know, I love, I love, love, love the book, Start With Why. Um, and I'll put a link to that down below if you haven't read it. It's, I highly recommend reading it. Um, and, uh, you know, that why really drives, really drives us and it can help you persevere through things, um, you know, obstacles and difficulties that come up, problems that come up if you have a really strong why. So being clear on that why. So me, you know, I'm, I've, been in this kind of phase right now where I'm stepping back. You may have noticed I haven't uh, been as consistent at posting uh, podcast episodes and stuff. And a big part of that is because I've sort of lost track of my why. So it just resonated with me. I need to like just step back for a second, get back in touch with my why am I doing this specifically, but you know, just generally everything um, in my life and make sure in my life uh, to make sure I have a clear why uh, as to why I'm doing uh you know, all the things that I'm doing. So that's my takeaway. What's your takeaway? Go share on the forums, automatresource.com slash forums. Love it. And I'll see you next week. Incredible episode lined up for you next week. You're going to love, love, love that one. So, all right. See you there. Peace.